Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cape Ann Today. Today, Heather and I are at the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute at 147 Main Street in downtown Gloucester on the beautiful working waterfront. Good morning, Heather. Hi, Corey. How are you? I'm great. We're both nervous because... Uh, <laughs> we're in a science building. We're in a science building. <laughs> yeah. Science is not our thing. Beakers. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. I was yeah. an English major. Oh boy, yeah. I can't, going back to even uh, biology, chemistry, it's two terrible. subjects yeah. completely over my head. I can do this all right. I mean, I think I can do but this nothing. okay. Yeah, but, other yeah. than drinking out of a beaker. We start measuring and mixing, um, yeah. and yeah. So, so I am excited to have these conversations today with all the folks from gmgi.org, by the way, if you want to learn more. Uh, starting off is the executive director of GMGI, Chris Bolzan. How are you, Chris? Good to see you. Terrific. Thanks for coming in to see us today. Yeah, we love it. We, we chatted during COVID yes. um, briefly through, uh, through a, a Zoom conversation, so it's great to finally meet you in person. And right off the top of my head, it's just amazing how, how much GMGI has grown yes. in such a short period of time. We're now we're celebrating 10 years already. Yep, uh, this is uh, going into our 11th year now. We wow. celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. It was really nice to be able to do so alongside Gloucester's historic 400th. Mm -hmm. Wow, you timed that well. Yeah. <laughs> that was smart. And that was fun because we were able to really work with the 400th committee and talk about you know really honoring our maritime history, but also looking at GMGI as a beacon for hope for what the future might hold. Mm -hmm. Well, that is so interesting because ever since you landed here on Gloucester Harbor, there's been that talk of this is the future of the waterfront. But people might get a little confused sometimes because there are two parts. There's this, the academy and then there's the research institute, yes. right? Yes. So do you want to describe that to us? Sure. It might be helpful if I tell you a little bit about our mission because mm -hmm. GMGI's mission is to address critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. And the hope is that by bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, we can catalyze the regional economy. And that's part of the goal. We have a three-pronged approach of doing really innovative scientific research powered by genomics and coupling that with truly innovative, hands-on vocational learning that can train Gloucester's young people to become laboratory technicians. And by doing these two things well and intentionally, we can create new jobs and new opportunity here in Gloucester that is all a part of our maritime history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that line, transformative workforce, workforce development, because that really is such a critical mission to being in this community. Too, yes, right? definitely. And we'll talk more about that, I know, later on. But, yeah. Um, yeah, and our, you're here today at our research institute right, right on the harbor front, but we have two locations. Um, and we started with our academy building, which is up in Blackburn Center. Um, that was the original GMGI oh. location. And when our students were done for the day, our scientists would come in and do their work in that laboratory. This building didn't open up until 2018. And, I was um, all wrong about that. I thought you started here. I no, apologize. No, no. Yeah. The academy started first, okay. and um, which is and since I've been at GMGI, I joined in 2019. The academy has tripled in size. We've had four ribbon cuttings, and three of them have been up in Blackburn. Um, we had the original academy location, which included a classroom and a molecular biology learning laboratory. But in 2020, with a million dollar grant from the state of Massachusetts, we added a biomanufacturing learning environment. And this November, with support from the city and um, $100,000 in ARPA funding, as well as a very generous contribution from an anonymous foundation, we were able to expand further at the academy and add new administrative space. Mm. So our team is now 34 people, and we have a number of open positions. So if anyone's looking to join our team, check out the website, because we're continuing to grow. Wow. Yeah, because I've spent a lot of time at the Biotechnology Academy yes. at Blackburn Center. And What's amazing there is um, you're placing these graduates into, their, into the job force. Yes. Um, from, from internships and right through. Um, and without necessarily a college degree, right? They right. Go no, all you need to um, join the academy is a high school diploma. No prior education <laughs> in science or math is required. And we have a fantastic hands-on curriculum that takes any young adults with very little experience 
right from our learning laboratory to internships here in Gloucester, in um, the incubator in Beverly at North Shore Interventures, and Boston, Cambridge, and beyond. Mm -hmm. it's, we have over 100 graduates working in industry now, and the academy program is starting to earn national recognition. Yeah. So. Well, go ahead, Heather. Well, I was just going to ask, what part of this do you love the most? Oh, a little bit of all of it. And I love the way our founders created a vision where these three areas of research, education, and science community blend and braid beautifully together and support one another. Because the workforce development program can help us attract new businesses to Gloucester. Um, we have LifeMind Therapeutics upstairs from us here, and we'd love to see more biotechnology and life sciences companies join us here in Gloucester, because I think we've proven to people that Cape Ann is a fantastic place to do science. And you're creating a workforce. Yes, we have them. a fantastically yeah. trained workforce ready to work um, in these environments, and we're watching our students, grow, our graduates, grow and develop into lab managers, research scientists. Some of them have gone on to earn college degrees, and we have articulation agreements in place with many colleges, including Northeastern, so they can get earn credit for the academy experience if they choose to enter college. But what we are seeing is that the degree and the learning and the certificate that they earn at the Gloucester Biotechnology Academy is enough to move them forward and propel them into a fantastic career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part about um, doing the work up there was seeing students who maybe weren't interested in the sciences at first, or maybe something piqued their interest, or um, they maybe un underperformed in other areas, and then they're brought there, and they're doing legitimate lab work. Oh, yeah. They're you becoming know, research scientists. Yeah. And for many of them, science was always an interest, and, but they were not encouraged or supported in significant ways that allowed them to really blossom in those areas. Mm. And the program that Dr. John Doyle and his team have created really can transform individuals into major contributors in the Commonwealth's thriving life sciences and biotech ecosystem. It's mm. unbelievable. But one of the most exciting parts of 2023 was a real milestone for GMGI when we were awarded a million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation for our academy. Um, it was GMGI's first NSF award as principal investigator. We've received other NSF funding for our research in the past. But this was an opportunity through a program that NSF calls the Excellent Program, which stands for Experiential Learning in Emerging and Novel Technologies. And it was awarded to a handful of organizations around the country who are taking young adults who maybe for whatever reason have not been able to access these advanced technologies. Um, they have diverse backgrounds, diverse education and professional experiences. And it gives us funding to support them on a journey to pivot into entirely new careers. So the funding doesn't help GMGI's operations or salaries or equipment. It flows directly to the participants wow. and allows us to support them in ways if they qualify with um, $1,000 a month living stipends while they're training, to support their housing if they have any food insecurity or transportation challenges, and it also helps us support some really interesting training in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm, that's amazing. That's amazing. That really is. That Thank is just you. such an important part of probably all employers should be thinking that way. Yes. You know, how do we support our uh, workforce? Yeah. yeah. And Chris, what an amazing marriage with you know the GMGI setting its roots here and serving Gloucester's working mm -hmm. waterfront, especially at a time where you know, people they often we always hear it. The marine industry, the fishing industry is a dying industry, and that's not necessarily the case. No, it's not. And our science team, who will be talking with you shortly, can tell you a little bit about some of the truly innovative work we're doing to support our fisheries. Um, and that's inherently part of the GMGI mission, to stay true to our maritime history and to really support the ecosystem here that is embedded within you know, 400 years of Gloucester's living history. Yeah. And it's interesting to point out, like, there's a, a lab right next to us where there's actually seawater from Gloucester Harbor that's pumped into here for testing and testing specimens. Um, it, the students are working with local fish 
and breaking down the DNA to make to make sure that the fish is local. If, if someone's saying it's local, like I followed fish fraud forensics, for example. Yes, you good know? memory. Good yeah, memory. Yeah. So these are things of the area, you know, serving and educating people from here. And that can also inform how we respond to environmental threats to our fisheries, to things like offshore wind and dredging. All of these are elements of the scientific work GMGI scientists are exploring. Hmm. Hmm. How, has, how are you collaborating with the, the others on the working waterfront or with um, the fisher folk here too? Uh, we have great relationships with um, the folks right here on the harbor, right outside our window, which is very exciting. We'll occasionally have uh, visitors who come in off their boats. They've captured something or caught something in their nets or buckets. Um, that they want us to take a look at and sequence or examine or study and it's a really fantastic relationship. We also have some of the fishing vessels who will take us out um, on sampling excursions mm. and so that's been a really unique part of the relationship with the uh, fishing community here in Gloucester. Yeah. And let's, since we're on your relationship with the city of Gloucester and the community here, do you want to dwell a little bit more on those ARPA funds that the mayor awarded you guys? Yes. That was a nice way to say, yes, we are part of this community. It was fantastic. Um, one of the things, you know, we've been challenged with is we're growing rapidly. Um, I think a little bit faster than our founders even intended, and we have really ambitious plans to grow further. Um, so real estate has been a bit of a challenge, mm. and but Mayor Verga has been and um, rep representative, representative Ferrante have been tremendous supporters of our work, Senator Tarr as well, and they've helped us solve some of those challenges. And we had an opportunity to expand the build out in Blackburn Center, and um, the mayor's funding really provided critical support and also allowed us to employ dozens of local tradesmen to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, the local tradesmen here are now trained in how to build a biosafety level two uh, <laughs> laboratory, and they've done a fantastic job both here and up at the academy doing so. So we are ready to help welcome new biotech and life sciences companies to Cape Van. Well, and Chris, to your point, how do you explain such rapid growth? Yeah. Well, I think it's a combination of things. People often ask us, how do we seem to punch above our weight? And some of it is the ambitions and support of our tremendous board, but we also have, it's almost like a hidden army of volunteers. We have a fantastic leadership council. We have a lot of local um, supporters and volunteers in the community who really help us. They serve as mentors and editors and fundraisers. Um, they guide us on strategy and all sorts of ways that have allowed us to grow a lot faster than anyone ever anticipated. And it's been incredible how much both the Commonwealth industry and the local community have really welcomed and embraced this ambitious mission. Mm. Mm. Now, we spoke about how many graduates have gone through the academy, too, and now you're working on things for the alumni? Yes, so I think John Doyle is going to be talking with you shortly, and mm -hmm. he'll tell you a little bit more about that, but that part, of our, part of our <laughs> NSF grant um, and um, another anonymous contribution that was made to us is allowing us to provide upskilling to our, our alumni, because the alumni of the first few classes didn't have access to the biomanufacturing or even the cell culture work that John began teaching a few years ago. So we want to bring them back and add to their professional development. And this is all part of a growing movement to really create a sense of alma mater amongst our students and our graduates and our community. Um, for the people who have gone through the Gloucester Biotech Academy, our number one source of new students is our alumni. We have great community partners that refer students to us, but our alumni are really an incredible resource for us and we want to continue to build and nurture that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Chris, for locals, I suppose, and the tourism season's about to hit, but really the locals who drive by the Main Street building, the beautiful building here on the water waterfront here, and maybe don't know what's going on inside, what do you want to tell them uh, that GMGI is, is doing day to day? Well, we have some amazing discoveries happening right here along the harbor front, and um, Andy Gardner and Andre Bodner will tell you a little bit more about the science specifically. But we create a lot of opportunities to educate the community about the fantastic science that we're doing. We host public talks. Um, we have some hands-on experiences as well. We have summer STEM learning opportunities for middle grade and high school students. So we welcome folks to tune in to our virtual talks, our in-person events. We have a fantastic event coming up at Gloucester Stage 
on May 9th, which I think uh, Ashley Justino and Logan Walsh are going to tell you a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. But we welcome folks to just reach out to us. Um, let us know if you're interested in a tour or coming for a visit or just taking a peek behind the curtain to see what's exactly going on in our labs. Mm, Nicely said. So exciting. Yeah. Chris, we thank you so much for your time today and, and telling us a little bit about GMGI. It's amazing. I mean, I live right down the street. I haven't been inside here before. It's very impressive. And like you, you mentioned, you alluded to, to the rapid growth. It's so cool to see something make it and impact so many people around here as well. So hats off to all of you here. Well, we couldn't do it without the tremendous support of the community and all of you share, spreading the word. And um, we weren't quite sure how we were going to follow up the momentum and excitement of our 10th anniversary. But 2024 is off with a bang with the hiring of our inaugural chief scientific officer, our CSO, Andy Gardner, whom I think you're going to meet next. next. So yeah. we're really excited about that and really appreciative of our opportunity to share the word of our work with uh, your audience. So thank you both for coming today. Yeah, thanks for having us today, Chris. Really we really fun. appreciate it. Yeah. Chris Mulzan, the executive director here at GMGI. Well, we'll have more from the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute on Main Street in Gloucester right after this. And we are back here at GMGI for another special edition of Cape Ann Today. Andy Gardner is the new Chief Scientific Officer here at GMGI, and he now joins us. How are you, Andy? I'm very well, thanks. How are you, Corey and Heather? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks. thanks for having us here, I should say. Absolutely. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess right off the bat, Andy, what is a Chief Scientific Officer? What is your role here, and how did you grow into this role? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, yeah, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer here at GMGI, and uh, it's, it's really a great role to, to, to bring uh, some of the science together and grow the science uh, and really build on the strong foundation that we have at GMGI in the science. And what we're hoping to do is grow that influence in Cape Ann and off island and, and really be a uh, worldwide leader in in genomics as, and marine sciences. So yeah. it's a really exciting role. So what, what are your day-to-day -day duties like? Here? Well, so I've been here for almost two months and so my day-to-day -day is really learning from all the amazing scientists that are here. Uh, from, uh, I'm not a marine scientist, so I'm learning all sorts of interesting things about the ocean, which is just absolutely fascinating. So what was your background before that made you, that um, gave you the role of chief scientific Chief scientific officer. officer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I spent uh, almost my entire career at New England Biolabs down the road in, in Ipswich, and I, I headed up one of the research divisions over there that was really tasked with discovering new enzymes 
and understanding how they work and then helping uh, different startups apply them in new and interesting technologies. Hmm. So it's a really a amazing company down, down the road and uh, I, I've had the opportunity to now switch to GMGI to apply some of those leadership skills oh. here. So it's, it's really great. So Andy, a lot of people yeah. in the area know GMGI. They see the yes. letters on the building and all that, yes. but what exactly is genomics and the differentiation between genomics and marine genomics? And why well, does it matter? Yeah. Well, so yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a, so genomics is, is in our name, so it's really a central part of, of what we do. So genomes are really the instruction book for any organism. Um, it's the instruction book for, for life, really. And it's a, a parts list of all the different parts that allow cells to uh, divide and replicate, to actually gain energy, to respond to their environments. And these parts are called proteins. So every organism has a genome, that's the instruction book, and that instruction book is made up of parts. Um, and so disease happens when your parts are, when the parts list isn't quite right or, or a part is defective. And so one of, the, one of the core things that we do here at GMGI is really go out into the ocean and understand the genomes from different organisms in the ocean. And I'm learning so much about the oceans now, it makes the land-based research really look really kind of boring compared to the oceans. Yeah. Um, there's been a ton of land-based research with different organisms and, and uh, across the world, but the oceans is really the next frontier. And so when we look at this instruction book and look at these parts lists virtually from any organism in the ocean, we realize that, wait a minute, we really, don't understand the parts that uh, are in these organisms, and things are missing. So there's a tremendous opportunity. Like proteins for were missing. You, or, yeah. Or, so okay. so so proteins that we think should be there really aren't. So there must be other proteins that are doing the job. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for for discovery from the ocean to really understand how these organisms interact with their world in, in the ocean, even right outside in the harbor to Stellwagen Bank, to other parts of the world, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for discovering new proteins and new biology uh, that will really really make an impact. Cool. Could you give us an example of um, a, a certain situation that was surprising in a missing protein or the part you thought it was going to be one set of genomes and it wasn't? Sure, sure. So uh, one of the organisms that I study is from a hydrothermal vent. So these are the, the, the uh, the parts of the ocean where they, they're, there's hot water percolating through the Earth's crust. So when we sequence the genome, when we have that instruction book and take a look at the parts list, there are, there are parts that are missing for what happens when the genome gets damaged. So in our cells, if our genome gets damaged, there's, there's enzymes and proteins that fix it. So these organisms are missing those that. enzymes. Yeah. So they, they either don't fix it or there are other types of enzymes that will actually fix it. So there's a lot of missing things and a, and a lot of room for discovering new things. That's so interesting. And as, as Chris said, it's really fun to be on the harbor. It's, it's a very place-based research. Um, Gloucester is a special place. There's a tremendous amount of local knowledge here from the oceans. And it is really fun when uh, the fishermen come in with a bucket of, of a, with a blue lobster or, or something like that. Right. Because we really feel that those, those missing parts of biology are really in some of these unique organisms that are, that are, that are in our oceans and right outside the door. Yeah. So is it possible for you to tell us how you can connect um, more or less directly this work with those fishing boats out there? Sure, sure. Um, so genomics, again, is, is trying to understand that instruction book and really trying to decode it. So it's understanding the health of the fisheries themselves, the health of the fish. There's some interesting projects uh, trying to use DNA to actually age fish. Um, it's a really hard problem to do. And right now, uh, to age a fish, you have to take out its ear bone and count up the rings. And so yeah. there's some research here to see, can we take a DNA sample and actually age fish? Um, and that, that will help uh, help the, manage the fish populations. So that, wow. that would be really cool. Very cool. Yeah. 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 We, can take a, we can take a sample from us, too, and, and age our, our, ourselves as well, based on our DNA. We can do that on our own. Yeah, right. yeah that's true. That's, that's a good do point. that every day. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, Andy, have you, have you learned about the local fisheries here? Is it healthy? Are the stocks healthy? Are the fish healthy or the marine life? 
Well, so that's that's what we're trying to figure out. Figure out. So we have some great par partnerships uh, with the fishermen and the, the state agencies, um, and you know this is an incredibly rich fishing ground historically, and and we want to uh, help contribute the tools to. to to really make it a robust and sustainable uh, fishing environment for everybody. Hmm. I think that's really important. Are there any is, in particular thing or species you want to be studying or is, is special, especially piqued your interest? Well, you know, I, I think it's all really interesting. Um, I, and, I, and I'm learning more and more about it. My, my, my fishing knowledge is basically from fishing, you know, off of, off of Cape Ann. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I've noticed in the past couple of years is, is the striped bass, bass population is kind of coming and going. So trying to understand mm -hmm. that a little bit, a little bit more would be would be useful as well. Right. From a recreational standpoint, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to in this new year for you? Well, I, I think putting in place the systems where we can have a tremendous amount of discovery of these new parts, um, translating some of those discoveries into innovative technologies uh, through partnerships with uh, local companies, I think will be really exciting. And I think uh, also this concept that Chris Bolzon talked a little bit about uh, of creating this, this ecosystem in Gloucester, I think is really compelling. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of our uh, Gloucester Biotech Academy graduates and having everybody under one roof, I think will really uh, create a really great ecosystem for a research-based uh, ecosystem in Gloucester. So mm -hmm. it could be really fun. Well, and Andy, I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask every guest this because I do think it's important too for the um, the person out there who does not know what's going on inside. Yeah. What do you want that person, whether it's a maybe a p potential student here mm -hmm. or just somebody interested in what's happening inside the walls here at GMGI? What would you tell them? Well, I think I think everyone, and especially everyone who lives in, in the Cape Area, Cape Ann area, are scientists themselves. Looking at the tide pools, um, you know, Pavilion Beach. There's all sorts of diversity and interesting things going on, most of which we really don't understand. So here on the day-to-day, -day, we're really trying to understand that biology, the parts that are unique to the ocean, um, and yeah. So so, and and those those types of discoveries will really have an impact locally, but also worldwide as we as we understand more things. Mm. And, and I'll also also ask, why do you love what you do so much? Because your enthusiasm is. Is well, you know, is, is the, uh, one of the things that I think the, the academy students really pick up on is that lab work is very hands-on. You're learning something new every single day. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really fun. Very nice. Thanks for your time, Andy. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks. Andy Garner, he's the new Chief yes. Scientific Officer here yes. at GMGI. Uh, awesome stuff, and we're really impressed with what's going on here. And, and Great. Thanks for spending a few moments thank with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. We'd love and to come back, as a matter of fact. I was going to say, I would love to come back and find out how this year went, and if you found those proteins. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're those gonna missing make, proteins. We're going to make really well, great discoveries. What was going on with them. So, yeah, we'd love to know more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank a little you. homework assignment there. All right. There's Andy Gardner. He is the um, Chief Scientific Officer here at Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute. We'll be back with more from Cape Ann today, right after this.
And we are back from GMGI here in downtown Gloucester on its working waterfront, talking all things GMGI uh, this morning. Uh, now joining us is Andrea Bodnar. She is the Donald G. Combe Science Director here at GMGI. Good morning, Andrea. Good morning. Welcome to GMGI. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. being with us today. So I guess right off the top, um, what is a science director? What do you do? And I guess we should probably even talk about um, Donald G. Combe for a little bit as well. Yeah, it's a, Donald G. Combe is a founder of New England Biolabs. Uh, he was a truly inspirational scientist, so I am honored to, uh, to have my position named after him. Um, and we have a common connection because we both have a passion for not just the ocean, but also sea urchins. Mm. Specifically? Yes. Mm. <laughs> well, I guess, so a little bit about your background and your path to GMGI. Uh, yeah, so I have a rather unconventional scientific background. I'm a biochemist by training, um, but in the early part of my career, I was mainly focused on studying human biology, uh, with a focus on studying age-related diseases and cancer cell biology. Oh, but wow. that all changed when I moved to the beautiful island of Bermuda and joined the Marine Institute there. And that's where I got really excited about the ocean. Uh, the ocean is home to amazing diversity of life. There's so much we still need to understand about the ocean and so much we can learn from the oceans. And so that's where my passion for the ocean began and uh -huh. that path took me to GMGO. So there's a lot of research going on here and I know you're leading a lot of that work. Do you want to talk about it? I do want to get to the sea urchins, but tell us about everything you're doing right now in, research, in terms of research. Yeah, so our research strategy is really based on questions related to oceans and human health. Um, and we have three main focus areas. The first one is fisheries, the second one is ecosystem function and health, and the third is biomedicine and biotechnology. So in our fisheries program, we're really using genetic and genomic tools to understand the full scale um, of populations of commercially important fish and shellfish, mm -hmm. and really using those tools and that information to promote sustainability and to ensure global food security. In our ecosystem function and health program, we're using genetic and genomic tools to understand the full scale of diversity of life in the ocean. Not only the organisms that are there, but how they interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. And really that can tell us something about the resilience and the ability to adapt in the face of change, especially mm. impacts like climate change. And in our fisheries, or sorry, our biomedicine biotech program, there we're exploring the amazing adaptations of marine organisms to inform questions that are directly related to human health. Oh. So we have a program that's related to understanding longevity, healthy aging, and resistance to cancer. Um, but we also have a great interest in exploring the diversity of marine microorganisms um, that may be producing products that could potentially be developed into therapeutics for disease or discovery of new enzymes for applications in biotechnology as well as um, other commercial and industrial applications. Oh. So I would love to hear a little bit more breakdown of just one of those pieces. Could you do that? I mean, it all sounds so fascinating, but it's very broad mm -hmm. and, and it sounds really important. Just could you break down one? Uh, I could talk about my own research. Please, sure. yeah. yeah. So, so I am really fascinated by the long-lived animals that live in the sea, coming from a, a traditional training of understanding aging and age-related diseases and cancer biology. Mm. I've become fascinated by the long-lived animals that live in the sea. These are animals that live for centuries without showing signs of aging and with no reported cases of cancer. And so, so our fish goal- Fish or reptiles? Or there actually, there are fish that can live for a long time. The Greenland shark is an example of a fish that can live for 400 years. Whoa. Um, there are, uh, the bowhead whale can live for more than 200 years. And there are many marine invertebrates that can live for hundreds of years, including the quahog clam. Um, but my personal favorite is the red sea urchin, which can live for more than 200 years. And so what we're hoping is by studying these animals, uh, we'll understand the mechanisms by which they remain healthy throughout their lives and keep disease at bay. And we can translate some of that information to preventative or therapeutic strategies for human age-related degenerative diseases and cancer. So sea urchins are my model, <laughs> and they're a fabulous model. They've been a model for scientific research for more than a century. Mm -hmm. uh, we know a lot about their biology. They're also commercially fished, so we know a lot about their life history. And what's interesting from an aging point of view is some species only live for about two years in the wild. Other species can live for more than 200 years These in the urchins. wild. These are urchins, sea yes. urchins, yeah. <laughs> well, oh, interesting. Yeah, so the red sea urchin is among the Earth's longest living animals. And so by studying this animal, we're beginning to understand how it achieves its extraordinary life history. And so we actually just finished sequencing the whole genome of the red sea urchin. 
Jeez. And actually this week it was just published in a scientific journal, Cell Reports. Um, and by looking at the sequence of its genome, it's starting to give us some hints uh, to the secret of the success of this animal um, and really allow us to address more questions. Understanding its immune system, which is incredible and in helping it defend itself against infectious disease. It has a really sophisticated nervous system to sense and respond to its environment. And it has um, an expansion of genes that are protecting its genome. Um, so we think it's playing a really important role in uh, avoiding cancer. So extra genes that we may not have that's protecting its genome. They, they're actually the same gene, but in cases where we have one copy of that gene, they have two or three copies of that gene. So they have extra protection. So I, I have a basic question, uh, and it might return to Andy Gardner's conversation. How do you know that they are 200 years old or 400 years old? That's where the link to fisheries is really important for any fisheries management. Knowing the population structure and the age structure of the population is critically important to effectively manage the population. So for most animals that are commercially fished, we have a lot of information about their aging. So for sea urchins and other animals that have hard shells, um, actually you can count growth rings on the shell. So they will lay down shell uh, in a seasonal pattern. And so similar to counting growth rings on a tree, you can count growth rings on the shell and that's one indication of how long they live. The fisheries also do a lot of um, tag and recapture studies to model population growth and longevity. And for some of the really long-lived animals in the ocean, like the red sea urchin, um, when you think back to the era of atomic testing, we introduced a lot of radiation into the atmosphere and into the oceans, and that was taken up by organisms that were making shells at that time. And so you can actually uh -huh. mill back the shell to find a point in that shell where that signal drops, and we, you know that that's pre-1950s growth of that that's animal. That's amazing. Jeez. That is I ironed my own shirt today and I thought I would impress myself. But <laughs> 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 that, that, that takes the cake. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. Jeez. Wow. So, Andrea, the, the fascination with sea urchins, when did this begin? And how did it all come about? It really began when we, uh, we made a move to Bermuda. So I had had a very traditional uh, scientific background up until that point, but when we went to Bermuda, I was really introduced to the amazing organisms that live in the sea. Uh, and just serendipity, I, I helped with a course where they were working with sea urchins and started researching them. But what was fascinating to me is all of the questions I asked, the answers weren't what I expected based on what I understand about human biology and human aging. And so that's put me down this really interesting path of understanding that not all animals animals age, um, not all animals degenerate, and many animals are very good at resisting uh, diseases like cancer. And so really, that's, that's um, an, an animal that's really um, a great model for those questions, but the nice thing about sea urchins are they're really easy to handle in the lab. Mm. So some of these other long-lived animals, yeah. like the Greenland shark and the bowhead whale, are really not conducive to, <laughs> to laboratory studies, yeah. but sea urchins are easy to maintain in the lab, and they've been a model for, uh, for scientific research for more than a century, so there's a really nice body of knowledge that I'm building on. Mm -hmm. So we understand that your team is getting out there in the world kind of getting around and, yeah. and traveling a bit, right? Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, our, our team is able to get out in the field quite often, and that uh, includes both local waters as well as international waters. Um, so one example of that is we have a really nice project going on in Stalwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Mm. This is a really important, productive, um, and vital part of our ocean. And so our team has been going out to take water samples and sediment samples throughout Stalwagen Bank uh, National Marine Sanctuary, bring those samples back to the lab, extract the genetic information, and they can look at the whole diversity of life that exists in these samples. And so the team is working really closely with NOAA to integrate this genetic information into the biodiversity assessment, really to help to promote um, the resilience of this ecosystem into the future and preserve it for the future generations. And so we're working in collaboration with the local fishermen to collect our samples in Stellwagen, so that's a great relationship. Uh, we also have a fantastic uh, partnership or collaboration with an organization called Ocean X, um, and that allows us to get into global oceans. In fact, one of our scientists is currently on the vessel uh, with Ocean X in Singapore this week. Wow. 
Wow. So what does OceanX do exactly? They're actually a combination of media and science, and so they have a wonderful research vessel in which they're making documentary films about the ocean, really to promote uh, stewardship of our ocean and a better understanding of our ocean. And at the same time, they're well equipped for doing science. So they're doing both um, documentary filmmaking and promotion of the ocean as well as science. And so this has been a fantastic partnership. Our team is going to be with them this summer in Indonesia, oh, wow. uh, in which we'll be able to bring our genetic tools to better understanding Indonesian waters, so the diversity of life uh, surrounding Indonesia, to, to really understand the marine protected areas, the diversity there, and the vital fisheries of the region. And so it's going to be a really exciting summer for our team. Oh, yeah. Very impressive. So are you able to say what you're seeing as one of one or maybe three of the biggest threats to biodiversity? There are a number of threats to biodiversity. I think climate change is, is certainly a, a big a big driver of yeah. changes in biodiversity and loss of biodiversity. Pollution is another driving factor of that. Um, and also uh, over harvesting. So, yeah. I, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a lot of combination that we're seeing for loss of biodiversity. And that's something that we really want to be able to bring our genetic toolkit to the ocean. First of all, to better understand what's there, but also to be able to model and project how our oceans will look in the future. And so mm -hmm. I think the power of these technologies and understanding biodiversity and function of our ocean is, is unsurpassed and really can provide new information about understanding the ocean and the organisms that live there. I think that's important for fisheries, for conservation, as well as new discoveries that could potentially impact human health. Mm -hmm. Well, Andre, I just want to know, why do you love what you do so much and the work that's being done here at GMGI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's just ter tremendous opportunity for new discovery. I have a really curious nature. There's so much more we can learn. I'm just fascinated by all the ways nature has solved problems. And I think that there is a solution to every problem we're seeking if we know where to look in nature for the answer to that problem. And so I'm really excited about all of the possibility of discovering new things. Mm -hmm. mm. Well said. Well, that was fascinating. We really appreciate your time, Andre. See, that was pretty easy, right? It was great. Yeah, quick <laughs> and yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andre Bodnar, she is the uh, Donald G. Yeah. Combe Science Director here at the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute on the working waterfront in downtown Gloucester. Thanks for your time again, Andrea. Congratulations on all your work you're doing here, too. It's very impressive. Thank you very much. I hope we can come back and talk to you again. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Right, we'll be back with more KPN today right after this. And Cape Ann Today returns. We are at GMGI this morning learning all things about marine genomics, Heather. We have learned a lot already. And I could, have, I could be here all day. Three interviews did more than four years of high school and college for me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Apparently, we have not learned about the immortal jellyfish. 
So we're going to have to do another show. Yeah, that'll be the yeah. next visit. So, <laughs> All right, joining us now is John Doyle. He's the Education Director here at GMGI. And Laura Rashane, she is the Director of Partnerships and Enrollment. I suppose, good morning, both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having that, us. Yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Biotechnology Academy, among other things. Great. Okay, so I guess right at the top, John and Laura, um, I guess explain to folks uh, exactly what you do. Laura, we'll start with you. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Director of Enrollment and Partnerships, and so I'm sort of an outward-facing person. Um, I don't do the teaching, but I work with students to and potential applicants to invite them to come to the Academy and give them information about it. Um, and I also work with our partners, both our community-based partners and our industry partners, um, particularly when we are arranging internships for our students. Mm -hmm. And does every student do an internship? Every student that successfully completes the training does an internship. Yep. And, and John, talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. we've been working for a long time yeah, together. Sure, yeah. One, can you believe it's been 10 years? <laughs> no, <laughs> I would have never imagined had you told me. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I got you on camera every time, too. Which is <laughs> but I, yeah. Just explain your role here as well. Sure, I'm the education director. Uh, my general role is curriculum development. Um, I do some of the teaching. Uh, I help with internship placements, um, fix the sinks. I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess let's start with um, the Biotechnology Academy. Okay, where is it and what goes on inside those walls? Sure, so uh, we're located at 55 Blackburn Center. Uh, what we do is we train recent high school grads, they're anywhere from 18 to 30, to become entry-level technicians in biotech and life science labs. Uh, they're with us for uh, six months, hands-on, bench training, um, you know, as state-of-the-art equipment as you can get in the industry. Uh, it's all been vetted by industry professionals. Uh, students spend six months learning the techniques, learning the instrumentation. Uh, we have a second curriculum that focuses just on career skills, so things like professional communication, your organization, your time management, um, how to interview, how to write cover letters and resumes, how to manage your finances. We try to make them as well-rounded as they can possibly be when they leave the academy uh, and enter the professional workplace. Um, so students who successfully complete those six months of training are then invited to partake in the three month paid internship experience. Mm. Um, and you know, we support them throughout the internship uh, and then we help them with placement uh, once, they, once they finish the program. So if they wanna go on to college or they wanna stay in the professional workplace, we, we help them with that. So in a nutshell, that's what the academy does you know, throughout the year. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna reverse engineer that question. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a 16 year old and I, or 17 year old, and I don't know what I wanna do, and I've heard about you. What are you gonna tell me about the academy that is gonna make me wanna go there? Do you wanna? You want sure. to take okay. part well, of this? Of all, I'll, I'll, I, have, I have my answer, but you can so go So first of all, if you're a young person that might be interested, we always say you're always welcome to come visit. We love showing people what we do. Um, and you know, one of the things that makes our program unique is it's very hands-on. So young people who you know, might not have been successful in a traditional high school classroom um, often do very well in our, in our program because they are working at the bench and they're learning science by doing it. So that's one thing that makes us really unique. Yeah. I remember speaking with the students that were over the years where what they're working with, this like it's beyond university level equipment and lab Absolutely. work and all that too, that's very hands on too, it yeah. makes it special. Um, sort of piggybacking on what Laura said, um, the one thing, we have non-traditional students, right? These are mm -hmm. students who don't want to necessarily sit in a classroom and listen to lecture all day. Uh, they want to learn with their hands. I was very much the same type of learner when I went through school. And you know, 80% of your day is going to be spent doing science at the bench with this really high-end equipment that you're going to see when you go into the workplace. So you're going to be really well prepared. Um, the other thing I like to talk to them about is the time. Right, the program is is a nine-month program. I like to talk to them about the cost. Right, we don't charge tuition for our students. Those who can show need, we we actually give them stipends to attend. Mm. So. Um, when you start to talk about time and the debt that you could potentially run into if you go to a four-year or even a two-year college program and you don't know what you want to do, I mean, that's a lot of time and money that can be wasted trying to figure that question out, right? Mm -hmm. um, this program is going to put you on a professional career path in nine months and, um, you know, you're not incurring that kind of debt. So uh, that's sort of the angle that I like to take with a 16, 17, 18 year old, mm -hmm. that sort of makes sense to them. 
Totally, yeah. yeah. Something I would add too is that we have a staff at the academy that is completely committed to student success. So we have an amazing teacher-student ratio. Um, every class, uh, every cohort is around 20 students and there are always at least three full-time teachers with them at any time, often more than that in addition to volunteers. Um, so students tell us they always feel like they have someone to go to when they have a question. They always have support. Um, they always have someone to meet with if they need to. So um, it's, a, it's a really positive, supportive place to, to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask what um, what particular messaging are you, or how are you reaching these students to begin with? Are they finding you, or are you seeking them? How does that work? Yeah, it's sort of a combination of those things. So first of all, we have uh, 116 alumni now who are um, really our main source of spreading the word. So a lot of times we have people approach us and say, hey, my sister attended the academy, or my friend, or my cousin. So that's always really helpful. Um, we also have a close relationship with staff at high schools, particularly at uh, Gloucester High School, um, which are they're fantastic to work with, um, as well as community-based organizations, as, um, such as Action Inc., um, which has a compass program that helps young people get their, their high set. Um, and. Uh, helps them figure out what their next step is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different, a lot of different sources. Um, yeah. and John, are you in touch with alumni as well? Because I know there's, yeah. we're working on programs to get in place to involve yeah. the alumni more. We've always been in touch with alumni, but this past year, uh, past two years, we've really tried to expand upon the offerings that we're giving to our alumni. So um, trying to build out networking events for them. We have a jobs board, online jobs board that they can refer to. Um, we are doing uh, this coming year, we started a, um, a, uh, a quarterly um, newsletter for them to, to keep up with what's going on at the academy. But this summer, we're starting an upskilling um, program for them. So they're two week uh, short courses that the alumni can attend. In the first four years of the program, we didn't have the biomanufacturing and cell culture curriculum uh, the way we have it now. Um, and those students didn't get it at the level that the students are currently getting. So we're inviting the alumni to come back uh, and take those two week short courses in July. So if there are any alumni out there, if you guys are listening to me right now, and you want to come back and learn these skills, um, you know, we're, we're offering it this July. So that's a, a huge um, support for them. We've also built out our articulation agreements. So we have agreements with local colleges and universities um, for uh, credit. So if students have attended the academy, um, they can go to the local colleges and universities and earn credit with them for having gone through our program. So we're in the process of expanding that network of schools. Right now, North Shore Community College, Salem State, and Northeastern University are all offering credit to our graduates, um, but we're trying to expand that network uh, to other schools as well. So a lot of really cool stuff right now for alumni to uh, take advantage of. Mm. Laura, I want to ask you specifically about the partnerships that keep growing here at the GMGI. The excitement, how are these folks learning about GMGI and how are these relationships coming about? So are you talking specifically about community partnerships? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if it's expanded beyond that, because it seems like GMGI is as well. Right, How right. That, well, we, yeah, we think of that in different ways, right? So we have community partners who I think a lot of times, um, whether it be a high school, whether it be a community-based organization that has young people they're working with, and I think what happens is they see um, how much their graduates loved are doing our program. They see how successful they are after going through our program um, and going into the workforce. And so then, um, you know, we work with them to sort of establish a pipeline. Um, so that's one way that um, we work with our community partners. Mm -hmm. And then we also have industry partners. So as I mentioned, we, um, all of our students complete internships. And so we're always looking for additional biotech companies, academic labs, um, and working with them. And again, they're finding that um, after the six months of training that John described, our students are highly qualified. Um, and then they're, they're not typical interns. Um, mm -hmm. They're not coming in green and not knowing what to do. I mean, they are very comfortable at the bench. They've got very robust skills. So they're learning during that intern internship, but they're also contributing a lot to the work that's happening in those labs. Mm -hmm. So give us an example of what is, will be happening with the 2024 graduates. So where will they be going? Great, great, great question. So our first cohort in the class of 2024 just started their internships last month. Um, and they're 
in a lot of different labs um, and companies around the North Shore, Boston, Cambridge, uh, and beyond. So we have just a few examples. We have a student that's studying immunology um, in a lab at Harvard Medical School. We have a couple of students who are doing cancer research at the Center for Cancer Systems Biology at um, Dana-Farber. Um, we have a student working at a, a new startup in Lowell, um, developing innovative treatments for type 2 diabetes. Um, and we have a, a student doing cell culture right here at GMGI, right here in Gloucester. So those are just a few examples of what that cohort is doing. And they will graduate at the end of May. Mm -hmm. Um, many of our internship partners end up offering full-time positions for our students, um, so we anticipate a lot of them will follow that route. Some of them might choose to go back to school using those articulation agreements that John mentioned. Um, and our second cohort uh, is well into their second semester, so they are studying topics like protein purification, mammalian cell culture, and they are now actively interviewing for their internship, so they will intern this summer and we have some very exciting labs for them to, to do that with as well. Mm -hmm. And they'll graduate at the end of August. Wow. So, John, have you been here since the beginning? I have. So, can you, yeah, we <laughs> talked to um, Chris Bills in a bit about just the rapid growth here too. What do you attribute it to? And what's it been like, how the feeling has it been to see GMGI grow into what it is today? We, I attribute it to the amazing staff that we have here. Everyone who works on this staff is an absolute hustler. I mean, we, we work. I, I remember talking to someone very early on and they were saying to me, this was back 2015, 2016, and they said to me, I can't believe how much burn you guys get out of you know, the funding that you have. And it kind of hit me then that you know, we have people who, they, we work, we really work, and we really believe in the work that we do. Um, you know, my staff at the academy, I can say, we are, you know, every morning we get out of bed, we are absolutely dedicated to seeing those students succeed. Um, they are students who just, you know, they've been told no a lot in their lives, and we know that they deserve better and that they can do better. And, um, you know, it's, it motivates us. So I would say the absolute, you know, number one reason or number one answer to your question is the staff and how hard we work for what we do. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with John, and I would just add too that our students themselves are just amazing. And what happens is they go out in the world and they're finding success in all sorts of ways, and um, they represent us, and so then people hear about us, and um, that allows us to grow as well. So. Yeah. So Laura, if a student wants to learn more about the Gloucester Biotechnology Academy or find, or find you or contact you, how can they yeah, go about doing that? Absolutely. So we have a website. Um, you can come right to the GMGI's website. There's an education page and an apply section for that. So um, our application is open now. Um, for, for next fall. For, for next, fall? yep, yep. So yeah. our next two cohorts will start in September and January. Um, and so uh, folks can either start that online application, which is right on our website, um, which will get me their information and I'll reach out to them, or they can contact me and my information is right on the site. So like I said, we have open doors. We love having people visit. Um, I'm always happy to chat with folks and give them more information about the program. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. Uh, Laura Rashane and John Doyle uh, from GMGI. And all things Gloucester Biotechnology Academy 2 of. Check it out at 55 Blackburn Center as well. All right, we'll be back with more Cape Ann today right after this.
And we are back at the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute at 147 Main Street in downtown Gloucester for another special edition of Cape Ann Today. Heather and I are now joined by uh, Logan Wall. She is the development director here and Ashley Destino, the communications manager. Good morning to you both. Hi. Good morning. We're so excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. You invited us, so we are. So we have to say thank you. We've been waiting for a couple of years to have you guys here. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So I guess right off the top, uh, Logan, a uh, bit about your background and your duties here at GMGI, and then Ashley with you. Sure, I'm the uh, development director here at GMGI. GMGI is a not-for-profit, which means that we do a lot of fundraising, grant writing, our scientists write uh, research grants, and we connect with philanthropists and donors of all size gifts to help make GMGI a reality. Uh, GMGI was founded on the generosity of many uh, important donors and that uh, continues to this day. So me and my small but mighty team work hard to bring the community closer to GMGI, tell our story in compelling ways and really inspire people to give of their own wealth to help make GMGI in our future a um, reality for Cape Ann and for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as communications manager, you know, my goal is to get the word out about all the amazing work that happens here at the Institute and at the Academy. Um, I heard you ask Andy, what is genomics, right? Like, there's a, it's a big word for some people, they don't know what it is, so sharing our mission and our work and our research um, to a, an audience that might not know a lot about us, it's a really exciting opportunity and um, it's fun. And it's through social media, our website, newsletters and things like that. Yeah. And actually, we've worked together for a long, a long time, time now. Yeah. And I guess let's just touch upon just the growth of GMGI I know. in the time that you've been there. I was, when I started back in 2017, I was number seven, employee number seven, which is crazy. And now we're over 30, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, you know, Chris mentioned that this, we have a multiple locations, and um, we were in an administrative office up at Blackburn Center, which was, you know, like right across from the academy. So to have this building now is just, it's amazing. And, John Doyle talked about how it's all about the staff and the hard work that we do. So I can, uh, com I can double that as well. Mm -hmm. So do we want to get into uh, GMGI's involvement with the community and are there things uh, on the agenda yeah. for this spring? Yeah, we love being out in the community. Like I said, just sharing our work. Um, the best way to do that is to have our staff out there and talking about what we do. Um, we were just, I think it was last weekend or two weekends ago, at the Power of Play event from the Gloucester Education Foundation. We had a table and some of our research and academy staff were there sharing science with you know the younger kids in Cape Ann and it was just really fantastic. But yeah, we've got some other events coming up that the community can be involved in. Um, Laura mentioned our graduation that's held at the Cape Ann Museum. Um, we've got a really great art science lecture that we've been doing for a couple years now that kind of bridges the two worlds of art and science that we've found is really interesting to a lot of people in Cape mm. Ann. Um, and that's going to be happening in October. Is so that the Burns lecture? The Burns. Um, no, that's actually not the Burns lecture. Oh, it's, it's something not, sorry. different. Yeah, Logan can talk to you about okay. the Burns lecture. Okay. But um, yeah, we love getting out into the community and sharing our science. And you know, our um, academy does some open houses so you can learn more about the academy. Um, program through those. Um, we're always looking for ways to connect with the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now, yeah, what is this Burns event? All sure, about? sure. So some people may recognize the, the name Burns, uh, the late John Burns, who um, him and his wife Molly have been supporters of many not-for-profits on Cape Ann and, and beyond. We're uh, founding donors to GMGI in, in a way to recognize and honor John for his incredible commitment to GMGI and being an advocate for GMGI, we established the Burns Lecture, which we'll do every year. And it's an opportunity for someone from GMGI, one of our scientists, to give a compelling lecture to the community in memory of John. Um, and this year, our inaugural lecture will be given by Dr. Andrea Bodnar, and she's gonna talk about biodiversity in marine protected areas. So people may not realize that Stellwagen Bank, just off the coast of Gloucester, is a marine protected area. There are dozens of them across the world, and they're really um, these hotbeds of biodiversity that we need to protect and understand more about. And many of our scientists here are at the forefront of understanding marine protected areas. So Andrea's gonna delve deep into that topic. I think inspire many people to understand what's off our back door here, and, um, and then how we can use that to inform uh, the protection of marine protected areas across the world. So that's going to be held in partnership with Gloucester Stage on May 9th, oh, and nice. we're oh. just about ready to hit send on the invitation, so people can look forward to that. Well, I think you have the right person speaking. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to say also. I mean, you heard from Andrea and Andy about our science, but we have an incredible research staff that does an amazing job explaining our science. It's really high-level stuff that, you know, we're all still as 
administrative teams like still working to understand, but our research team does a really incredible job just getting it really understandable for the audience that they're speaking to. So we're really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So Ash, what other things that we want to be talking about that uh, GMJ is up to this spring? Yeah, I mean, there's those events are really big. Um, Laura was just, Laura and John were just talking about the um, applications being open for our summer STEM programs as well yes. as the um, academy program. So both of those applications are live and available on our website. Um, we have um, just a lot of things going on. We gotta be looking out for some announcements through our um, social media and our newsletters. Andrea mentioned her sea urchin research and the team just sequenced the, sea, the genome of the red yeah. sea urchin, which is incredibly exciting. Um, we've got a press release going out later this week on that. Um, so just keep an eye out for things, you know, press releases and um, updates on Academy happenings. Um, you can always find those things through our social media channels, our website, um, and we have a bi-monthly newsletter if people are interested in signing up for that as well. Mm -hmm. And I can highlight two other events for our um, donor community, uh, we host every year an academy breakfast where we have students stand, uh, we'll sit in, in front of our donors and really give their compelling story about their journey through the academy program. And really because it's built off the support of so many donors, we like our donors to hear those stories. And there's never a dry eye in the, in the room. These students are really, really um, inspiring. So we have that event coming up, which happens just before graduation, which is on May 30th. And then um, we also established, uh, not too long ago, the Ferrante Postdoctoral Fellowship, mm -hmm. which is um, named in honor of Anne Margaret Ferrante. And every year when we name a new Ferrante Fellow, we like to have that fellow give a talk to the community. So date has yet to be set for that, but probably sometime late spring, early summer, we'll have um, our Ferrante Fellow give a talk here at GMJ all about their research to the community. Mm. So this is specific, the, the, under the Ferrante Fellowship, it's one research project that is done by this student, is that right? So, so we, um, the fellowship will support a postdoctoral researcher to come to GMGI, which is a, someone who is early in their scientific career and they come here for a limited period of time to really uh, fine tune their research um, with the help of our more established scientists. So um, we will, uh, when, they're, when they're here, they work on a specific project and, we, and it's usually cutting edge, exciting, something that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise if they weren't here with us, so we want to share that great story. Very exciting. Yeah. Logan, how receptive has the donor community been? Because they're also seeing the progress being made here at GMJ as well. It must be pretty exciting. It is, you know, I think what's most heartening is that um, we have complex science. And some people might immediately say, ooh, I'm not a scientist, I can't be part of this, I don't want to be part of this. But the reality is the vast majority of people that support GMGI are people that are just curious, they want to learn more, they are at a point, at any point in their, in their life, and they want to understand what is genomics, what can GMGI do for the ocean. And I think that um, the more, as Ashley's mentioned, we can help them in that journey of understanding the science happening here, the impact of the education program, it does inspire them to want to help us get to that next, to that next um, level of the organization. So do you enjoy doing the storytelling that goes along with your job? Because it must be pretty exciting to it is. say everything that's happening here. It is, definitely. And as Ashley mentioned, you know, we are constantly looking at how we can retell, recast the story. We have to look at a lot of our different audiences. So we have some donors that are scientists and they want to dive deep quickly. And we have some donors or supporters that this is the first time they've even said the word genomics. <laughs> and so we have to meet them at a different level. So for us, it's really about segmenting people and helping them get to the place where they can leave here feeling, I got that. When we have our visitors leave GMGI, they have to feel, I got that, I feel smarter, I feel engaged, I, I, I want to come back. If they leave and they're kind of lost and confused, we've probably lost them forever. Yeah, right. And actually, more to Logan's point, um, yeah. connecting, better connecting with the public. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the tours at all and where did that take place and what that entails? Yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities and, you know, Logan runs the tours as well, but we do a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities for people who might not have been in the building before, like you guys who reach out to Logan or myself and say, how can we, how can we see what's going on? And Logan and his team does a, do a really great job of organizing really interesting tours where they go through both locations, the Institute here as well as the Academy Labs. Um, and just give really um, interesting facts and overview about what happens in those labs. Um, 
How and often does that happen? Sure. So uh, people can reach out to us one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. If um, you just want to come in for a tour, you can go to the website, contact myself or my colleague Rachel. Um, we can set those up pretty, pretty easily. We've had great success, and I would ask anyone if you have an affinity group, you have a, a church, you have a book club, you have an alumni group, and you want to get a small group of people to come here um, as part of you know, your social group or your, whatever group you're part of, we love hosting those types of groups. So we're very open. We know that the only way we're going to advance as, a, as an organization is to open our door more and get more people part of our network. So being able to bring people in is um, a top priority for us. And we also have the, um, Logan and his team are also, um, they get the help from the scientists when they do the tours, and sometimes the scientists give a presentation on some other aspects of their work, which Logan said, like Logan said, it just really brings people in and they get really excited about it and want to learn more. Cool. Yeah. And actually, you said a little earlier, too, that um, GMJ is hiring. Yeah. So the, for what types of positions? Everything. Really? No matter what you do, there's a, an opening. Yeah. So there's, <laughs> it's true. There's, uh, so there's research positions open. Um, there's academy positions open. We have finance positions open. Uh, we have a student services position open that's there to help the students through their journey at the academy. Um, really, there's a lot for, is something for everybody mm -hmm. at the moment. Lots of growth. Well, and lastly, I want to know what you, Logan, would tell someone from the outside looking in about what you love about GMGI, what's going on in here, and just sort of explain what they may be missing out on, what they sure. can learn more of. I think, you know, really the crux of it is that Gloucester is an incredible community. It is globally unique. We have an incredible history, and that maritime history of going to the ocean for discovery is part of the DNA of Gloucester. And GMGI represents another evolution of going to the ocean for incredible discovery that can change the world and change the local community. So I think people that are just excited about understanding something fresh and new and cutting edge here in Gloucester, like who, who would have thought that this would be here? And it is here and it's thriving. Um, and we are really, we want people to be part of this. So if you want a community, you want to meet people, you want to be inspired, um, this is the place for you. And, and we have an ambition to be regional, state, national, global, so we can also um, help people expand to um, places beyond Cape Ann. There really is something for everyone. Mm. And Ashley, you've been a part of this community for a long time now. Yeah. Maybe it's, what would you say to that person who's walked by or driven by and hasn't been inside the building? Yet? I would say I would just welcome them to learn as much as they can about us. Reach out to me or Logan or anybody on the team. Um, we want to share what we're doing. There's so much exciting things happening inside these buildings. Um, Reach out to us via our website, sign up for our newsletter that comes out bi-monthly, um, learn things on our social media posts. Um, there's a lot of way to get a lot of ways to you know stay up to date with us. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate the work you're both doing and, and everybody here at GMJ. It's been a fascinating morning uh, learning more about uh, everything that's going on here. There's so many, it's so multifaceted. Um, but Logan Walsh, Ashley Justino, thank you once again. We hope to come back and do this again sometime I hope so soon. Too. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. All right, Heather, that was a morning. So good. I'm going to those lectures. Are you really? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I need to hear it more from Andrea. Oh, great stuff all around. Okay, we great. want to thank today's guests here at the uh, Glossary Marine Genomics Institute. Uh, Chris Bolzian, Andy Gardner, uh, Andrea Bodnar, John Doyle, uh, Laura Shane, Logan Walsh, and Ashley Destino. We have to, of course, thank our crew, production coordinator Tyler Harrison, uh, IT and video coordinator Tom Manning, our social media coordinator, and on camera today, Bradley O'Connell. Senior Operations Coordinator and also on camera, Emily Games. Uh, floor Manager, Al oh, happy birthday, Emily, by the way. Floor Manager, Alana Horn, Executive Director, Eric Archer. Uh, our next show of Cape Ann today will be live at Maritime Gloucester, Wednesday, May 1st. Ready for that one? We're staying on the harbor. I feel I like, like we studied up already yeah, right. for our visit over exactly. here. We have so. questions for them. Yeah. yeah. All right, folks, from all of us at 1623 Studios, thank you once again, GMGI, and we will see you next time on Cape Ann Today.